So we've seen that economic decision making requires uh, attention uh, and variety of other ways in which attention can affect the way in which we frame decisions. So what I wanted to do here is talk a little bit about just the, the, the setup of decision making and then uh, continue to focus on awareness and attention. So the nature of your preferences are complicated. That's what we've been seeing, right? We've been seeing that through a process of wanting, liking, and learning, you relate certain kinds of actions um, to a reward system, and then through learning, realize um, that relationship to convey to yourself that hedonic gloss of pleasure that allows you to think about preferring one thing to another. And as you've seen in Marriage and Kringlebach, that process is majorly complicated. <laughs> and you read that kind of horribly complex paper, not to just harm you, but because I want, really wanted you to see that even the mechanical sense of what it is to generate that hedonic plot, you know, gloss, pleasure, very difficult to find mechanically in the brain because it's not just the valence, that is to say, whether it's like pain or pleasure, up or down, um, but its intensity is so contextualized by many, many parts of the brain. So the preference formation is complex. But even if you now have a way in which you can look out into the world and order your preference for certain kinds of actions over others, for certain kinds of tastes over others, or whatever they are. You have to manage your activity of achieving those different prefer you know, preferential goods via constraints. Constraints of time, constraints of money, constraints of you know, location. And economics, as we've seen, is this way in which you're trying to do as well as you can, given your preferences, interacting with your constraints. And um, next week, we'll look at the formal neoclassical model of how consumers do that very thing. Now, you have your preferences, you know your constraints, and what you have to do is look out into the world and see what's salient, that is to say, what's you know, important for your decision making. But just remember, in the, this, in the card trick that I showed you, or we talked about the um, attentional blindness, your preferences, your learning, and the reward system produce your creation of salience. You decide, you look into a situation, and you decide what's salient and go from there. If you're off, if, you, if actually what's important is not seen by you, errors can be made. And this is why bounded rationality is really important to think about. And, you know, how that bounded rationality interacts with your learning, this information, the cognition, rich repetition, and, you know, what it takes to search receive benefits. All of this, which what I've just put under information, is it's a kind of computation based on a limited sense of what you can afford to focus on and figure out. So you might not get the very best thing, because the very best thing in the, on the entire planet might be very difficult to search out, and you have to sort of manage, because of these constraints, second element on the left. Manage potential future benefits to the cost you have for searching. So you can see through this process that one of the things that's essential 
That's awareness. Now, it's true. It's very true that a lot of what you're doing is outside of your awareness. We've seen, right, there's unconscious liking. There's even, which is interesting, or at least they're, they, don't, they don't prove it, right, because it's difficult to prove, but they, they, they show in, in the Barrage and Kringlebach paper that evidence seems to suggest there might be something even like unconscious liking, which is pretty weird if you think about it. Pleasure state that you don't feel. And we saw um, a kind of liking model of how that might work in the world with that uh, Kool-Aid example where people had a kind of response that wasn't hedonic to happy faces, angry faces, or neutral faces, yet their, their preference, their stated preferences for the drink were affected by um, subconscious, as to say, not, they, weren't, they weren't actively aware of seeing the face happy, angry, or, or neutral, but the sub subliminal presentation of those faces actually had them change their preference states. So where all that is true, and that is occurring all the time, awareness of situations in which, that, in which that's likely to occur are important. That is to say, what kinds of areas are you, know, you most susceptible to um, unconscious cues? Like when you're very afraid, or when you're, um, you know, when you're intoxicated, or whatever, they might be, you might not be actively aware of what's occurring, but you might be responding. So those kinds of environments are probably you can sort of like frame which of the environments in which that's most likely to occur. That's pretty important. So awareness even there, when you're talking about a subconscious realm, is important. But obviously, it's important when you're making conscious decisions. When you're managing your preferences, managing your constraints, thinking about the opportunity cost, which are of course forecasted, you know, losses. All of this requires um, an ongoing awareness because that which you, you know, the, you know, the cognition which decides certain kinds of things, um, you have to be aware of the outcomes. So in the repetition, you can you can repeat something over and over again. But if you don't pay attention, like you know, me and the, the light switch in the front of the room, right? <laughs> I turn that off a couple times a week, but I never pay attention to which switch it is. <laughs> I'm starting to because I keep talking about it. But just because you repeat something doesn't mean you can learn something from it. So what I want to do now is to turn to the the cultivation and importance of awareness and, and mental activity. So what you see before you is um, an experiment done by dudes at Harvard um, in 2005. <clears throat> and this is some of the research that's been done on plasticity of the, of the, of the, of the, the, uh, the brain. And, uh, and that is that how different parts of the brain um, react to different kinds of training. So in this um, experiment, um, I'll, I'll just go right to this. We, we have someone playing a five-finger exercise on a piano. And here, the um, response in, in, in section of the brain that's being affected um, from this physical activity is progressing in this way. So as you, as you practice the you know, the, 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 this, this motor part of the brain is developing with this kind of practice. And this is what, this is kind of a, a visual look at what it might, like muscle memory might look like. You know what I'm saying? So this is, this is the kind of sense of why, 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 why in music or in uh, sports you repeat the same action over and over and over and over again. And that it becomes, um, uh, it becomes automatic. And you call, some people call that muscle memory. 
And this is sort of a physical example of what's occurring um, with physical particles. But in here, we had, we had, we had on, on this side, they had an, another group of people who did not actually do the, they, they knew the actions of the five finger exercise. They had done them. But instead of actually physically practicing, they very directly, calmly, and with attention imagined themselves doing the five finger exercise. Okay, to the extent that people were actually doing the physical practice. So they did it for that duration. And what you see is something quite remarkable. And that is the response in the kind of like muscle memory-ish kind of thing is very, very similar, similar to the physical practice and the mental practice. Now, this, I mean, this change in mental activity from thinking is kind of trippy and I think relatively important. And Moby Britain um, at Brown has been working with college students um, in, through a program they have, a contemplative studies program. And she has a neuroscience lab um, where she's worked on a variety of different kinds of issues, as you see before you here. And one of the things she has done is been interested in how in the way in which meditation differs from other ways in which people focus, um, to put mental focus on activity, like music and dance. Um, all of these have the impact of that kind of mental activity that we saw of the five finger exercise. There's greater attention and great, the greater ability to focus. So she was kind of, she's been interested in what's what's different about meditation from focusing on something mental like music or dance. And one of the things that um, she's interested in is the way in which meditation in and of itself affects the mediation of the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So the way in which these parts of the brain, we might think about, you know, broadly kind of limbic area and prefrontal cortex are related. Now, Thinking of them as kind of separate units is not a very good uh, model in that they're, 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 they're certainly not distinct from one another and they're not, they're, it's not as if one does one thing and one does the other because as we saw in the marriage and Kringlebach, there's too much interaction. The brain is really complicated in the way it, it is networked. But one of the things about emotional functioning and certainly reactivity is the way in which the amygdala um, is mediated by activity in the prefrontal cortex. And the thing that Willoughby's really been interested in is what kinds of practices enable us to affect that mediation most powerfully. So if it's simply attention, you know, like, a, like practiced attention, then this kind of mediation and emotional regulation should be very similar between mus musicians, dancers, and meditators. But that is not the case. And in this paper, published in Frontiers of Human Neuroscience um, just last year, she and her colleagues looked um, here in this paper only at music oh, and they compared uh, the, the clinical symptoms before and after a 12-week course as you see here. Now, the way in which, you know, overall affect and emotional balances is actually occurring in someone is kind of difficult. 
to ascertain. So this is what they did. They looked at word recall, and particularly positive word recall. Um, and then they also measured subjective well-being, uh, measures of depression and measures of anxiety. And what they found is that, indeed, the meditation group had um, increased well-being, um, which was associated, you can see, sorry, increased positive word recall was associated with increased psychological well-being and decreased clinical symptoms. So unlike the you know, musicians who clearly devoted a lot of time and effort to attention and focused attention, meditators had other results. And this is the, this is the kicker. Mindfulness training was associated with greater improvements in processing efficiency for positively valence stimuli than active control conditions. So a, this is one of the ways in which my, you know, uh, meditation is one of the ways in which to develop awareness, um, not just focused attention. And the interesting thing about this is it affects the way in which our, our reactivity is um, exemplified in the world. And of course, this is important for uh, the way in which you act in the world. So these, these studies and others like them um, have the, really been part of a growing interest in this, which we have before you here, is this the neuroplasticity of the brain, that actually attending to mind states actually affects physically the brain. So how is it that we can have physiological changes from experience, from attention, for example. Well, humans, like animals as you before you, have these impacts. And there are physiological changes in the brain as awareness is developed. And Sarah Lazar and others have actually shown um, what people who have participated in you know, meditation for many years can tell you that there are these changes. What, what they found is like, well, there are, there's physiological evidence here, uh, cortical thickness actually changing with sustained meditation. This is that study. So, um, <laughs> you know, like the, 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 those red dots, they were, they were, you know, for you, you guys are all way under 20, so your, your, your thickness, you can see, Thickness is changing some, um, but guys like me, way out by the 50 year old age, with, you know, without meditating, we get the, the cortical thickness it becomes thinner and thinner. Among meditators, blue dots, that's no, not the case. So the kind of natural progression of thinning of this uh, the cortical tissue is inhibited, which is quite remarkable. So these kinds of studies on brain plasticity and how you know, changing your mind can actually change your brain were um, kind of pioneered by um, a lab at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, um, and a guy, Richard Davidson, um, who will be here at Amherst uh, Tuesday evening. Um, and um, I recommend you go to the talk. It will be very interesting. And one of the groups he worked with were very uh, intense meditators <laughs> in the sense of uh, um, having done you know, thousands of hours, 10, more than 10,000 hours 
meditation and focused meditation of various kinds of elaborate kinds. And what you see on the right there is uh, changes in, in brain activity w w under meditative states. And uh, um, rather than go through you know, exactly what gamma activity and phase synchronicity is, um, basically there are um, ways in which you can think about like foc focusing attention. And so these guys who have spent a lot of time focusing attention, um, <laughs> It looks, you know, turns out that you can sort of show the difference, and uh, you can actually see in a, in a, in a like in, the, in, on to, on, in this A, B, and C here, like where when they began meditating, when they didn't, you can, you can clearly see what they're measuring. Let's not get into. <laughs> so um, again, here you can see a various ways in which um, the the resting state and the concentrated state of these meditators is remarkably different. Um, and one of the ways in which they've thought about these, um, these concentration is to work on something called loving-kindness meditation, uh, a cultivation of, of open-hearted, kind of like well-wishing. Well and um, this practice has actually changed the way in which these monks' brains process information and the way in which they decide to act in the world. Um, so from the very start, they can see the role of awareness is essential to decision making, but the cultivation of awareness itself affects the process that Berridge and Kringlebach are writing about. That is to say, the way in which the brain manages rewards. And what's significant about this, as you can see through this process, is it not merely ma changes it, but modifies and changes the reactivity of the brain, such that you can start acting in ways that are less automatic when you choose to have less, less automatic responses. This has profound implication for well-being. 